Hello photography students, welcome back to our virtual classroom. Uh, today we are going to talk about using light to reveal hidden evidence. Let's get started. Using your internal flash or an external flash, an EFU, is a good way to add light to your images. And most people think of the flash as an automatic setting. You know, they uh, turn on their digital cameras or in their phones and they either set it to on or auto and just snap away. And if you're stuck using your internal flash, there isn't a whole lot of control in it. In the cameras that you guys have from the bookstore, you should be able to dial down or dial up your flash output but that's pretty much it. That's all you've got going on. Um, in your ex if you use an external flash unit or a flashlight even, that can be much more versatile and it can be used to highlight and reveal hidden elements of evidence and we're going to talk about that today. So the images below are showing you a couple things. Um, the internal flash is shown on the right. Now your camera could have a pop-up flash like this Nikon does. Um, this is a DSLR so if you don't have one like that it's most likely built into the body of the camera and you can't move it. It's just right there. Um, if you look at the flash on uh, the center of your screen, that's an external flash unit. And that can be connected to the off shoe cord, which is shown on the left. The, um, the left section of that cord can be attached to the hot shoe, which is the top of a DSLR. And um, then it, the other end of the uh, off shoe cord can be attached to the flash unit. And so you can physically have the flash attached to your camera, but then you can move it all around. Um, there are other transmitters that you can use that connect to the hot shoe, the top of the camera, and also connect um, remotely to your external flash. The transmitter sends a wireless signal between the flash and the camera, so they don't have to be physically attached to each other. Um, and that gives you a lot of movement. It uh, gives you a, a lot of versatility. You can move that flash unit all around the scene while leaving your camera where it needs to be. Um, so obviously most crime scene specialists are given external flash units uh, because they are so versatile and um, that can be very important on a crime scene. But uh, for students and for uh, some agencies that just don't have the budget, you might be stuck with just using a little point and shoot camera. So we're going to talk about how you can get these shots um, using the camera that you have without um, all the uh, nice tools <laughs> uh, of an external flash unit and a um, offshoot cord. Okay, this image is from your textbook and it shows a shoe print in dirt using direct flash. Now direct flash means that the flash was held directly over or in front of the evidence. So um, there's a little image of the shoe print down there. Picture that that shoe is, that shoe print is on a horizontal surface, okay, and the camera is being held directly over the top of it. And we're going to talk more about that um, in the next few in the next few slides. But the flash is hitting the evidence dead on from a 90 degree angle, okay. Now this image, yeah, you can see a faint pattern in the dirt, but there's very little contrast between the hills and the valleys of the pattern, right? You can tell that there's something there, but seeing the detail is a little tricky because you don't really have a whole lot of contrast going on. You don't have um, any dark areas next to light areas to show you the pattern. We can tell it's probably a herringbone of some type. Um, but this image is not the greatest if you were looking uh, to see the details in the pattern of a shoot. In contrast to the shoe from another previous slide, this image was taken with an oblique flash position. Now oblique lighting means that the light source is held at a very low angle to the surface of the evidence or a raking angle it's sometimes called. Okay, Then you can see the difference in this little uh, picture that we have in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. The shoe prints on the same plane, it's on that horizontal plane, but now we've moved the light source down next to the evidence and the light is raking across it. Okay? Oblique lighting is the technique to use when you're dealing with evidence that is three-dimensional in nature. Okay, so examples of this are shoe prints, bite marks, tire impressions, and you're going to see um, a couple examples of that in, in future slides. 
So to take detailed revealing impression uh, photographs, you need to follow a few guidelines. And the first guideline brings us to our third cardinal rule, which is keeping the film plane parallel. And this is really important for um, 3D impression evidence photography, which can also be called comparison photography. We call um, photographs comparison photographs if we're using them to look at evidence that can be compared to a known or a suspect uh, item of evidence. So a shoe print is a really good example of that. If you have a shoe print and you take these types of comparison level uh, impression photographs, then you should be able to compare that evidence, the photograph, to a known shoe or a known shoe impression. Um, so these types of photographs can be really, really important uh, because the photographs themselves are the evidence. A lot of times we don't cast uh, impression evidence on the scene. That's um, something that you can do, but it's not done on every single crime scene. Um, on a typical crime scene where there's impression evidence, the photograph is going to end up being the actual evidence that a comparison forensic scientist is going to use um, to compare to a known or a forensic sample. So these can be really important. So let's talk about what I mean when I say keeping your film plane parallel. The second rule for taking good impression photographs um, is to make sure that you fill the frame. Okay, You fill the frame as much as possible with the evidence because that's what's important. right? The details are important. We've already shown in our overall mid-range photographs, which we're going to talk about in future lectures, where we've already shown the position of where that evidence is. So we don't need any of that extraneous or extra uh, background, right? We want to make sure to fill the frame. The second cardinal, or the uh, first <laughs> cardinal rule, right? We want to make sure that we fill the frame with the evidence. The third step is to make sure that you use oblique lighting from several different sides of the print. And this will make sure that the areas that are not highlighted from one angle will be highlighted from another. So imagine that you are standing over the top of the shoe print now, okay? You're looking directly on top of it. We've got some oblique lighting coming from the right, some oblique lighting coming from the uh, top section there and some oblique lighting coming from the left. So you guys are going to get a chance to practice with this, um, but remember that just lighting it obliquely from one side is not enough, okay? You need to work your way around the print. Um, ideally, you want to do it from four different sides. And if you're using a tripod, you can do that. And you're going to see um, some examples of that in just a second. Um, for our class, we're going to modify this exercise a little bit because most of you guys don't have tripods. Um, so let's look at that. 
these are just some other examples, okay? Oblique lighting isn't just used for shoe print evidence. It can be used to enhance a multitude of 3D impression evidence. So here's some examples, okay? These are some bite marks. And in your textbook reading for this week, you'll see that it's always good to bracket your exposures, meaning you put in more light and less light. You do a proper exposure. You do an overexposure. You do an underexposure. This was really important um, when we just had film photographs to deal with because you couldn't see the photograph that you were taking. Right now we have digital cameras, sweet little LCD on the back, and we can see the image right after we take it. But when we were dealing with film photography, we didn't know. We just had to have really good theory um, in our heads and uh, we would bracket. So we would take a one-stop overexposure and a one-stop underexposure, sometimes plus or minus two, um, to see which photograph turned out the best. It showed the most detail and that's what this series is showing. But as you can see the oblique lighting that the photographer is using is definitely highlighting those um, uh, tooth impressions in the bite mark. This is another example of uh, indented writing. You can see that as the oblique light gets more oblique, so that light source gets closer to the evidence and it's got a lower raking angle, you can actually read the indentation a little bit better, right? Flashlight not moving, flashlight moving. This is also showing an example of panning, which we're going to talk about a little bit more um, in the next few slides. Okay, dust print lifts. Dust print lifts or EDPLs, you guys might have heard of these um, in other classes. A lot of people think of EDPLs as uh, two-dimensional evidence because it's just a print on mylar film, but in actuality it is 3D because that dust actually has a little bit of depth to it. Um, so the techniques that we use for three-dimensional impression evidence that you typically think about, like shoe prints and tire tracks and things like that, the same techniques can be used for dust print lifts. Okay, now we're going to go through your individual work walkthrough for this week. Okay, This week you get to practice taking oblique lighting 3D shots on your own. And for this assignment you're going to need the four following items. Okay, You're going to need a can of Play-Doh, um, just one can. You can get it for about 90 cents at a Walmart or a dollar store. Um, or you can use the foam that comes in your CI kit if you haven't used that yet. You can make impression evidence that way. Okay. Um, if you're not using the foam, they can't stand up by itself. If you're using the Play-Doh, then you need a flat, thick surface that you can place the print on, like a book or a binder. I suggest a book because that's going to make it easier to keep the film plane parallel. Okay. Um, your camera, obviously, and you're going to need a flashlight. You can try using the flashlight feature in your cell phones, um, but it's much easier to use an actual flashlight for this. So I recommend uh, either getting one at Walmart, <laughs> or um, if you don't have one, or uh, borrowing one, because it's going to make it a lot easier to position your light. So, like I talked about before, crime scene specialists use tripods to make sure that their cameras are film plane parallel to the evidence, okay? But most students don't have this extra equipment. Uh, for that reason, we're going to flip the evidence and use a table and a book to make sure that the evidence is film plane parallel. And I'm going to show you guys some examples of that. But these are shots of actual crime scene photography setups, okay? The tripods are being used. The camera is either positioned um, reversed. Um, hanging in between the three legs or um, just left on its normal mount and tipped towards the evidence. Okay, So this is the perfect situation because you can bring that flashlight really low to the ground, shine it obliquely towards the evidence and you, or, or an external flash unit and move it all the way around the print. And that's what you would want to do. In this situation you want to get it from the light from all three openings of the tripod. Um, sometimes I take even a few more than that. I like to back my flash unit up a little bit, bring it in a little bit closer, um, just to make sure that I get um, highlighted all of the different details in the impression. So this is how you would do it on a normal crime scene. And by all means, if you have a tripod, definitely try this out and um, keep the evidence on a horizontal uh, plane and use the camera directly over the top. But if you don't, I'm going to show you a way that you can set up this assignment um, on a horizontal table surface. We're going to flip it. This is the setup you would use if you don't have a tripod. Okay, So you're going to make your impression evidence on the Play-Doh or on the foam, and you're going to put that on a book, turn it on its side, and put it 
on a table or some sort of flat surface countertop so that you have a flat surface to work with. In this situation, I've got my camera set up directly across from the evidence, okay? So it, I'm keeping the film plane parallel, right? Because the back of the camera is parallel to that book. They're set up in the same orientation. Now, I've used uh, our textbook to uh, give my camera a little height, which you might have to do to get um, the image uh, perfectly centered, okay? But this is how you want to set it up. This is the top view, okay? Again, you want to make sure that that camera is, the back of it is parallel to the book. I'm pretty close here. <laughs> the, uh, the image is uh, tipped a little bit, but the back of the camera needs to be parallel to that book, okay? And checking it from the top view is actually a good way to make sure uh, that, you're, that you're dead on there. Okay, and this is an alternate side view, just showing you guys kind of all around how I set it up. All right, the first image that you want to take is one showing the print filling the frame, either with no flash at all or with your internal flash. Now, this image, you might say, looks pretty good. I mean, we can definitely see a contrast. We can see some detail um, in the ridges and valleys. The reason that this image, even with direct flash, looks pretty good is because the impression is relatively deep. Okay, um, there's a lot of different um, ridges and uh, different angles, uh, different depths to this print. And because it's a shoe print and it's actually pushed into the dough relatively deeply, okay, a couple millimeters, um, you're going to be able to see some detail with your direct flash. And that's fine, uh, but you always, w if it's an impression uh, item of evidence that you're taking photographs of, you always want to use the oblique lighting to see maybe it's going to enhance it more. Okay. I would also suggest that when you guys do your oblique lighting shots, you want to do, you want to take them in a room where the light is definitely subdued. Okay. So turn off your kitchen light, turn off the laundry room light, wherever you've decided to set this up. Try to make um, the light pretty dark so that you can actually see uh, what your flashlight is creating. Okay. And that's something that we do on crime scenes too. If we have a shoe print that's outside um, in direct sunlight, well, you're not going to be able to use oblique lighting to really enhance anything because that ambient light, the sunlight is so bright, right? So what we do is we actually create shade. We'll bring out big umbrellas and shade the print so that we can actually see some details once we use oblique lighting. For the next image, you want to position the flashlight on one side of the print. Okay, so on this, we're doing it on the right side. Make sure that your internal flash is off. Okay, don't use oblique lighting and your internal flash because your internal flash is going to wipe out that really light flashlight oblique lighting, right? If you have somebody to help you, that's great. They can, you can have them hold the flashlight on one side of the print, um, and they're going to pan up and down. And what that means, like in this situation, the person holding the flashlight would move it from the bottom of the book to the top of the book, okay? So that that beam of light pans across the shoe print evidence. You don't want to hold the flashlight in one place and just kind of tip it up and tip it down, okay? That's not the right kind of a fanning motion that we want. You want it to pan, okay? So they're physically moving the flashlight to the top of the book and to the bottom of the book, but keeping it horizontal, okay? That's the way that you want to pan with your um, flashlight. Now, your camera I would say start out with an ISO setting probably of about 100 or 200. See how that works out for you. And I would set the shutter speed to a longer shutter speed, if at all possible, okay? If your camera has a manual function, which it should if you got it from the bookstore, um, it should have a manual function. So keep your aperture. You want probably like an F8, okay? And uh, set it for probably a full second your shutter speed, a long shutter speed, okay, because it's going to need time to suck up all that light. And play around with it. It's going to depend on the ambient light in the room, how dark you get it. Um, remember, you can change your ISO, um, you can change your shutter speed to get more or less light uh, because you have a continuous light source, right? You've got your continuous flashlight. So don't use your external flash to add light to this. You want to make sure that you're not using your internal flash at all. So play around with your camera settings. I would suggest keeping track of them to see which one uh, gave you the best uh, photograph, okay? 
So this is an example. This is the shoe print lit from the right side. And you can tell that there's, there's light coming in from the right side. And we've highlighted some of the hills, some of the, um, the little triangles there are a little bit darker. OK, it's giving us contrast. This one, uh, it, it looks like there's a little bit more detail to it. Uh, than our original direct flash. Okay, you can actually see maybe um, some lines in those middle triangles that you didn't see in the last one. Okay, so we're definitely highlighting some detail. The next image, you want to hold the flashlight or have somebody hold it for you at the top of the print. Okay, and you want to pan it from side to side. Don't hold the flashlight in one area and just tip it to the left and to the right. You want to physically move the entire flashlight across the print or have your assistant do it as you do this. Now, if you don't have an assistant to do this, you want to find the timer function on your camera. Okay, so that it gives you, there's a timer function that once you push the shutter release button, it actually gives you five or ten seconds before it actually opens the shutter. Okay, And that'll give you enough time <laughs> to run over to the evidence and um, get the flashlight in position. That's what I did for these. I used my timer function. Okay, And you can find where your timer function is in your manual. And here is the image of the shoe print uh, from the top. Okay, So you can see that different elements are being highlighted. And that's the point of all these oblique shots, OK? You're highlighting um, the evidence from all different sides to make sure that all of the details are at least present in one, uh, hopefully more, <laughs> uh, images. And your final shot should show the print being lit from the other side, right? So this shows the light coming in from the left side of this print, and I'm holding it obliquely and panning the way that we talked about. Now, like we said, if you had a tripod, you'd obviously want to light it from the last side, right, the bottom side. But in this instance, we have a table in our way because we've had to modify this exercise. But you guys get the general idea, right? You want to make sure that light is coming in from all different sides around the evidence and that it's being um, shown at the evidence from an oblique or low angle. That's the point of the exercise, OK? It's, it's to get practice with your oblique lighting techniques. So you want to be sure you keep the film plane parallel. And um, your light is the only thing that moves. Remember that. Your camera has to stay directly in front of the print. So you can't tip your camera to show the impression evidence. I see a lot of students do that. They'll come up to the evidence and say, oh, you know, directly on the top, I can't see any of the impression. But if I bring the camera really at a low angle, that's going to show you more detail. Well, that's true, but now you've created that distortion, right? And you're not keeping the film plane parallel. So that's not the technique that we're trying to do. It's your light that moves, not your camera. And good luck, guys. Uh, happy snapping. Email your instructor if you have any questions.